Thank you. Um, I'm Jerry Berman, uh, chair of the Congressional Caucus Advisory Committee, and uh, I just want to let you know that Representative Goodlatte, who was going to have lead a discussion with our distinguished uh, uh, tech leader, uh, was called to the House to vote. Then he got stuck in backup votes, and it's and those of you and anyone in this room knows how that works. But thankfully, uh, we have another congressman, a former congressman, but uh, distinguished in the sense that he is, when he was in, uh, from the state of Washington serving in Congress, the principal founder of the Internet Caucus, Rick White from the state of Washington, and he will introduce our, our guest and lead the discussion. Uh, a round welcome for Congressman White. Great, well thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, thanks, Jerry. I'm not Bob Goodlatte, so I'm going to turn this around. I will say this is fitting justice, though, because when I left Congress in 99 and Bob took over as uh, co-chair of the Internet Caucus, he was the guy who got to lead all those uh, delegations to Europe. I never got to go, so at least I get to do this instead of him. Um, I'm the, we're going to have a great discussion today with somebody who I think don't, doesn't need uh, much of an introduction to this crowd. It's uh, Bruce Chisholm, who's the CEO of Adobe. And uh, without going to a long explanation of, of uh, your biography, Bruce, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the company and how yeah. it was founded and what you guys are doing these days. Absolutely. Before I do that, Rick, I do want to thank everybody for joining us today. I'm uh, privileged to be here with such a distinguished group. I also appreciate you, Rick, stepping in at the last minute. I certainly won't hold it against you that you come from the state that represents uh, a small competitor of ours, a uh, small company up in Redmond. So I will not hold that against you well, at all. I appreciate all. that because Redmond was in my district when I was in Congress. So uh, in those days, we probably would have been on the opposite sides of some things, but no longer. Uh, uh, so let me uh, tell you briefly about Adobe. For those of you who don't know, uh, we're embarking on our 25th year of being in business, which for a software company makes us an old timer. We're probably one of the few that have survived the uh, Microsoft onslaught uh, through the years. We're approximately $3 billion in revenue. We uh, are worldwide with about half of our revenue outside the United States. We have about 6,000 employees, uh, the bulk of whom, about 62%, are still here in the States, with obviously other people around the world representing um, our products and our customers throughout the different regions in the world. At the end of the day, what we do is software, and we do software that helps people and organizations communicate better. We're living in a world today in which there's this explosion of digital information. In order for that information to be shared and communicated, people are trying to create it in more compelling and engaging ways. What's fascinating, what most people don't realize, that just about everything that we look at in our daily lives have been touched by a piece of Adobe software. Clearly on the web, there's a high probability that the layout was done by Adobe Dreamweaver. There's a high probability that that website is being served up by Coal Fusion. There's a very high probability that that image that you see was touched by Adobe Photoshop. There's a high probability that the video that you're looking at, if you do a right click, is being done through Adobe Flash Video and was authored in Adobe Premiere or Adobe After Effects. Chances are the graphic or the illustration that you see on the web was done by Adobe Illustrator. Chances are that the type uses Adobe fonts. Chances are that the animation, the graphics were done using Flash or Flash authoring. And of course, all those attachments, all those documents were probably authored through Acrobat or Lifecycle in now what is officially a public standard PDF. Well, gee, that's pretty impressive. I think these guys at Microsoft better start getting worried because it sounds like you're, uh, you're pretty ubiquitous. I don't want them too worried. Yeah. Um, I, I prefer them continue to be focused on Google, and I'd be happy with that. I understand that. You know, I suppose most of us, um, aside from the real technological geniuses in the audience, uh, use Adobe because we are opening a document or something. That's when we're introduced to Adobe when we use our computer. And usually we just download a free version of Adobe and... and uh, you know, are on our way. How do you guys make your money? If you give it away, give it to consumers for free, just uh, how do you monetize yeah. your technology? It's a great business model, and um, 
For those of you who don't know, we actually tried many, many years ago to charge for that free reader. Nobody wanted to buy it, so we gave it away for free. So if anybody thinks that's a brilliant strategy, it's only because we failed with the first strategy. We give away our free clients. We give away the Adobe Reader. We give away the Adobe Flash Player. We're currently working on another project called Apollo, which is a, uh, the ability to create applications in, rendering PDF and Flash and HTML, and that will be free also. We make money on the authoring tools. So if you want to create those PDFs and you want to collaborate with them, if you want to add digital signatures, if you want to um, add, create forms, if you want to submit XML data, you have to buy Acrobat. Or if you're an enterprise or a government agency, you have to buy Lifecycle. For example, the IRS uses PDF to distribute all those tax forms. I think we're, they're up to about $2 billion. They save $3 every time they don't have to print and distribute a form. So $2 billion times $3, that's a big savings for the IRS and ultimately us as taxpayers. But at the same time, they buy software from us that allows them to make those forms fillable, to allow them to allow us to save them, to print it, and hopefully someday to submit that information electronically if Congress is so willing. Well, that's good. Sounds like a pretty good pretty good system. At least it's worked for you pretty well so far. So um, I guess we're familiar with what we use, and you've given us a good summary of some of your other good products out there. What do you have coming down the pike that you can tell us about? Are there some in interesting things that you're going to be helping us to do in the future? Yes. I good. guess you'd want to know more detail. I'd like to have a little bit more about it, a little bit more specific. 2007 for Adobe will be the richest product year in our history. We just shipped Acrobat 8 and the free Adobe Reader 8 which is much, much easier to use. It allows you to do multiple documents in one container or a compound document. It allows you to do forms in a very easy way. It allows you to do digital signatures in a very easy way. Shortly, we'll be shipping Lifecycle 8. What Lifecycle does, it allows you to do a whole bunch of interesting things around PDF that interfaces with the backend enterprise systems. And Lifecycle 8 takes it to a whole different level. We're about to ship Adobe Lightroom, which allows you, if you're a professional photographer or an amateur photographer, if you already use products like Photoshop or Photoshop Elements, Adobe Photoshop Lightroom allows you to organize all your photographs. And then in the springtime, we will release Creative Suite 3. In Creative Suite 3, there are 14 entirely new or upgraded applications all coming out within the same time frame. Of course, they're cross-platform Mac and Windows. So new versions of Photoshop and Illustrator and Dreamweaver and Flash and, and, and are all coming. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff coming throughout the year. So it's going to be a great new year for Adobe, a cool year, and hopefully as consumers of information, for those of you who consume information, you're going to get to consume stuff in a much more engaging, interactive way. Well, now, how did this happen? Did you plan to have uh, 2007 be a big year where a bunch of stuff came together? Did you have a research and development uh, plan that led us to 2007? Or did, was this kind of serendipity where things um, just happened at the same time? Some of it is timing. It's when we shipped the previous releases of the product and how long it takes to enhance it. Some of it has to do with the fact that we made a major acquisition right at the beginning of 2006. We acquired Macromedia, a smaller company, but one in which had many complementary products to Adobe. And we've been hard at work integrating those two sets of products. And it took us about 18 months or so to do it right. So that's what is the cause for a lot of this. Clearly, um, there are certain years that are not as rich as this year, but this will be a rich year. Well, and I have to ask the question, does a rich year in new product development lead to a rich year financially for you too, or is there a delay, or how does that work? No, it's it, probably it, not like Microsoft where you have a big Vista, you know, uh, it, it typically uh, coincides. We've given guidance to Wall Street, and we said we'd grow about 15% this year. I met with a number of the financial analysts up in New York yesterday, and they keep scratching their head, questioning whether we're being too conservative or not. I clearly won't answer that. All I keep reminding them of is we're prudent, we're cautious, we're conservative. 
it's much easier to surprise on the upside than it is on the downside. Always best to be conservative in those projections. I think that's exactly right, and you can beat your, beat your projections. Let's step back a little bit, take a little wider perspective. You know, um, you guys were present right at the beginning of the Internet. You're one of the companies, I think, that uh, allowed it to have the, uh, the um, universal application that it did. Um, well, what do you think about the state of the Internet today? I mean, does it look like it's uh, doing pretty well? Are you concerned about anything, or yeah, what do you it's, think? It's fascinating, especially if you spend time in Silicon Valley and in the Bay Area. Everybody talks about Web 2.0. And you have all the private money, all the private venture firms throwing all kinds of money at the next Google and all these kids who think they're going to get rich like, like uh, Larry and Sergey did. And um, traffic has picked up again so you can't move and the restaurants are all packed again. It, it almost feels like uh, the dot-com scenario bubble that we experienced a number of years ago. And I kind of laugh because Web 2.0 as good as it feels to all of us, is really, in my mind, nothing more than Web 1.1. It's the implementation or the execution of everything we all talked about five years ago. So true. Yeah. And, and I believe that what you're going to see over the next couple of years will make today's Web 2.0 experience antiquated. What, what you're going to see a couple of years from now is, first of all, you're going to have just about everybody connected through high-speed networks, whether that's Wi-Fi or fast uh, cellular connections or cable or um, uh, satellite, satellite TV connections or WiMAX. I don't really know, nor do I care. But the reality is everyone will be connected through really high-speed connections. The second thing that I think you'll see two years from now is where we connect from is going to begin to change radically. I predict, I'm not sure it will be two years, but I predict, predict that sometime in the next three or four years, more people will be accessing the internet through non-PC devices than PC devices. And it will be mobile handset devices. It will be consumer electronic devices like Sony PlayStation 3 or 4 or Nintendo Wii. It will be uh, dashboards within your automobile. It will be a whole bunch of gadgets that will all be internet connected. And how the information gets displayed and accessed and searched for will be completely different than what we all experience today on our laptop or our desktop PC. You know, that's interesting, and I, I go back to your comment about how what we're really at is interpoint, Internet 1.1, because um, one of the things we're going to talk about in our panel after lunch is the fact that 10 years ago, when we founded the Internet Caucus, we all talked about the great, exciting things we were going to be able to do, and frankly, we probably thought we were going to be able to do them a little sooner than we actually were able to do them. And I, I remember reading um, you know, Nick Negroponte's book and Bill Gates's book, and it was just incredible what was going to happen right around the corner. It's actually taken us a little longer to do that. Um, although I, I think we're getting there in most, most cases. How about this next phase? Do you think it really is going to be two years before we're, or everybody's getting it on their cell phone? Or what's your, what's your um, real prediction? I'm willing to bet there'll be at least uh, one major service in the United States by the end of this year that gives you a great web experience on your mobile phone, one unlike that you experience today. In fact, if you go to a place like Japan, where you have NTT Docomo, who's the dominant cellular carrier there, they already offer a, surf a service called iChannels, which happens to be um, enhanced or supported by our flashcast technology, where the user actually has channels of web information that's experienced like a TV channel. And instead of having to surf for the information, the information comes to you in a very elegant way. In fact, consumers, there are 7 million consumers in Japan today that pay Docomo on average $4 per month for that premium service. I suspect you'll have a major carrier here in the U.S. offering a service like that by the end of this year. And that's the sort of thing you'd be looking at, uh, uh, a Docomo kind of you know, uh, related service. A Docomo related service, yeah. hopefully with a carrier here, whether that's Verizon or Singular or a cable company or, or, or is still to be announced or determined. 
The other thing that you'll see is over the next couple of years is just a greater use of video in more interactive ways. In fact, I was sitting with the, the kind folks from the PBS station up in Boston, and they were showing me the ability to do closed caption um, um, communication through a flash video as you're watching the flash videos for those who need accessibility. You're going to see lots and lots of video in a very interactive, engaging way. You're going to see lots of real-time collaboration. We at Adobe offer a product called Acrobat Connect, which was formerly called Breeze, which today is actually being used by, I believe it's the um, 101st Airborne Division in Iraq, to help train the troops and help communicate with the troops over there. You're going to see for every interaction the ability to have live video chatting. And of course, you're going to see lots of sites that have wonderful interactivity in much more elegant ways than you see today. But we'll be eager to do that. I think we've all got one of these devices in our pocket. And we'd love to be able to do a little bit more with it than we can. So I hope you're right on that prediction. Um, <coughs> now, if you look out at this audience, you probably can't tell. Um, you've got quite a few tech people. But you've also got a lot of people who work for the government. And uh, one of the things I noticed when I was back here is that the technology industry or community and the government community really are two pretty different worlds. They don't always uh, go together too well. In fact, I guess the technology guys are working on my microphone right now. Um, but let me ask you this question. As somebody who's really done well and done a great job of establishing an important product in the technolo technology industry, um, what, how has your relationship with the government been? Are there things that the government has done poorly that have really impeded our progress, that made it hard to do what we needed to do? Are there things that they've done well? Um, just give us your general sense for uh, what the relationship is like these days. I, I think the U.S. government has made a great deal of progress. I, I, I talk about the, uh, the situation with the IRS and how they've been able to save billions and billions of dollars. I look at the U.S. courts, the fact that they currently get four million court documents from the local court system every single month in PDF and are able to process that information. The fact that with the change of the bankruptcy law that they could adjust to that so quickly is just a great example of how they've been able to incorporate technology into their work needs. In fact, without it, they couldn't have been able to adjust to the new bankruptcy laws. So I look at those wonderful things that the U.S. government has done. There's room for improvement. I look at the fact that the IRS allows us to download all those forms. We could fill them out. We could print them. We could save them. We can't submit the information electronically directly to the IRS. We have to go through a third party. That's absurd. This doesn't make any sense. Doesn't sound efficient to me. Or I think about the use of digital signatures within the, within the government. It's happening. It's not happening as quickly as possible. The, event, the ability to take advantage of things like Real ID Act. Every state's going to issue a, a driver license that's secure, that everybody knows that all of the identity has been checked. Well, if all we did was, was stick a little smart card on there, a little, smart, a little chip on there, we could use that card for many, many thousands of transactions at the federal level, at the state level, and local level. What frustrates me as a U.S. citizen is I go around the world and I meet with all of these other federal government agencies in other, in other geographies, and it really pisses me off that they look at the U.S. for leadership in e-government, they try to imitate what we say we're going to do, we move a little bit more slowly than we would like, and they actually beat us to the punch. I go to a small country like Belgium. Every single citizen in Belgium has an electronic ID card, and they're able to do all of their transactions with the government electronically. Or I go to Japan. They took socks seriously. Every document is going to have to be secured, and they're going to use products like Adobe's Lifecycle cycle Policy Server to protect those documents. So we talk about it, we make some progress, everybody else looks at us, and they leapfrog us. So my only hope is that we can move a little bit more quickly. I look at the, the big investment has been made. We've made the investment on infrastructure. 
tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars within the federal government to get our back-end systems in the right place. What we haven't done necessarily is match up those front-end business processes with the back-end systems. So we have information that keep, keeps getting uh, reused over and over again, not electronically, but manually. From the system to paper, somebody takes the information from paper and physically puts it back into the computer. That's absurd. And there's lots of technologies from companies like Adobe and others that could solve the problem. And I think we need to solve the problem. You know, I, I, I think you make some great points about e-government. And uh, uh, I certainly think we've all seen the, the improvements that the US government's made. And I know many of the state governments are doing a pretty good job at the e-government level. Um, what about just a government policy in general related to the internet and internet companies? I, uh, you know, uh, obviously the internet was developed here, so we must be doing something right. It certainly prospered in our country, and uh, we can take some of that for granted. Give me a couple areas where you think the government has done something that maybe hasn't been so helpful. Well, I, I don't think it's it's not of help. It's more what more can the government do to just move the internet along at a faster clip. I think an issue that most people in this room are well aware of is one that I resonate with, which is privacy and security. Every day you pick up the newspaper or go up on the web and you hear about somebody's personal information being exposed. And I think that holds back or, or the, the ability for people to want to do transactions. And I think doing things like um, smart cards, uh, helping with instead of two-way or two-factor authentications, doing three-way authentications with one extra form of identification electronically will help um, that along. I think the other thing as government agencies is the recognition that we're all living in a YouTube society. Everyone's expectations of what the web experience needs to be has gone up significantly. And not that I would expect every government website to be entertaining. It still needs to be engaging. It needs to be graphically stimula stimulating. Um, a piece of data that I read uh, a little while back said it all. Each and every day, we on average ignore 61% of the information that comes to us. I don't know how many emails each of you get every day, 100, 200, 300, but there are 1.3 billion emails that get sent every single day. And I can assure you most of those never get read. So for those of you in government who are trying to communicate to your constituents, whether it's another agency, whether it's directly with the, the individual constituent, whether it's with business partners, you've got to make sure that that communication is both engaging and secure. And, do, and, and when I say secure, I'm not talking about just security around what I think of as the perimeter. We've done a great job, and you've done a great job, on securing the infrastructure, making sure that the systems are secure, the PCs are secure. But there are too many instances where the document gets posted inadvertently, or the information gets sent to the wrong person. And there are tools tools from Adobe and others that could secure that document to help with that security. And yet, we haven't fully taken advantage of those technologies. Yeah, there's definitely a lot more progress to be, to be made. I, you know, we sometimes hold ourselves to a pretty high standard. We didn't even have the internet 15 years ago, and, and uh, obviously we've made a lot of progress since then. And I would also say that um, to ask the government to be entertaining on purpose is pretty hard. Sometimes they can do it inadvertently, but to do it on purpose, that's, engaging. That, that's engaging, sometimes... Engaging and not necessarily entertaining. Let me ask you about the industry. You know, um, the, uh, uh, obviously we certainly benefited in Silicon Valley and elsewhere from uh, this revolution in technology, and our industry, uh, the technology community, has just done a great job of developing some of these things. And yet, as you say, um, uh, once uh, the gates are open and people kind of see what's going on around the world, there are lots of other places where interesting things are going on. Do you think we're, uh, how does U.S. industry stack up today against uh, other, other companies around the world? Are we holding our own? Are we falling behind, which perhaps is to be expected? Are, are there things we should be doing better? Yeah, I, I think the high-tech industry in the United States is doing extremely well today. If you look like a, at a company like Adobe, we have practically doubled our employee base from 3,000 to 6,000 
over the last couple of years, and the bulk of that headcount growth has been right here in the United States, the bulk of it being in the states of, of um, Washington and California. Um, so with that said, we can't ignore the fact that there are places like India and China and Romania where Adobe does business, where we have a lot of R&D talent that continue to progress at a very rapid rate. Our challenge as a society, our challenge as a government, is to continue to make sure that the kids, especially at the grade school level, are trained and educated, motivated and inspired to continue to innovate. That they know how to, uh, that they are best in class in math and science. That our graduate programs attract them into their computer science programs. It's somewhat scary sometimes when, uh, I'll share with you a personal experience I had my last trip to India. We have about 900 employees in India. And we used to have this um, really fascinating, what I thought was innovative program. If you joined Adobe India and you stayed with Adobe India for three years, you had the privilege of coming to work for Adobe United States. And that was perceived to be this great, great perk, this great benefit. My last trip over there, I did an employee question and answer session, and I asked how many of you are looking forward to coming to the United States after you do your tenure in Adobe India? Not one hand went up, which reinforces to me the need to make sure that we have our own homegrown talent. And I think from at the policy level, it means doubling down our investment in, in, in our kids both at the grade school level and at the uh, college, university level. And just to, so how are you finding that now? Are you able to hire the people that you want, or are you, is it really be becoming a challenge? Fortunately for a company like Adobe, because we're ranked one of the best places to work in the United States by Fortune magazine, because we have really cool products and everybody knows who we are, we do a pretty good job, us, Google, um, Apple. We seem to do all right. But it's getting harder and harder. And I can assure you that many of our competitors are having a tough time. We need to keep educating our kids. Yeah, well, that's absolutely right. Now, Tim was giving me a little signal earlier, which I think meant that we had three minutes left. We now have no minutes left, OK? So I was going to ask for a question or two from the audience, but I guess we don't have time for that. Well, then on behalf of everybody, Bruce, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Bruce.